This is Lisa from Mobile Tech Review, and it's that time of year, the iOS versus Samsung Smackdown. Now, usually what we do is the Galaxy S8 versus the, in this case, the iPhone 8, you know, the smaller model versus the smaller model, and then the plus size versus the plus. But this time, Apple's flagship happens to be the iPhone 10, which is not the physically largest phone. So that's one thing that's before you even go on and think about anything else. Look at the difference in the size of these phones. If you want a ginormous screen and a big phablet experience, it's the Note 8 all the way for you. However, if you look at this and you say, man, I'm going to have to get my clothes redesigned to hold this in the pocket and my hands are just not big enough, then you might want to just consider the iPhone 10 or a smaller Android phone too. So I just want to point that out because this time, you know, usually we would have like the, the iPhone Plus versus a Note or something like that. They're, they're that different in the size, which is interesting and makes the iPhone kind of a little special because it's one of the few flagship phones that isn't absolutely ginormous. Anyway, we're going to smack them down now. Beyond the obvious important thing of the size difference between these two phones, when it comes to price, they're both expensive phones, they're about as expensive as you can get. In fact, the iPhone is the a bit more expensive one. Wow, just when I when I did that Note 8 review, I thought this is ungodly expensive. Well, the iPhone's even worse. There's more specials from Samsung on pricing though, especially now in the holiday season where they're giving $400 off if you trade in a phone, all that sort of thing. So the Note 8 actually might be the more affordable. Of course, it's been on the market for many more months, so typically phones do get discounted, particularly Samsung devices. Apple, a little bit less, but carriers do have all sorts of BOGO deals and things like that going on, which is buy one, get one free for those of you who don't speak acronyms. Now with iPhone versus Samsung, every year it's three topics. One of them is that whatever the current generation highest end iPhone is, is going to be faster in terms of benchmarks than whatever the fastest Samsung phone is. And there are a couple of reasons for this, and it still holds true. This is true right now. It's because number one, Apple has an advantage because they typically come out about six months later in the release cycle. So things are still, still moving that fast in mobile CPU land that six months is enough time to make something faster. But also to Apple's credit, they are wickedly good at designing CPUs and GPUs, and they are just fast. Now, benchmarks aren't everything, right? You know, synthetic benchmarks are something that can be gamed and don't always reflect real world experience. But in real world experience, iPhones tend to be very fast and fluid and typically stay that way. Whereas with Android phones, some Android users complain the phone seems to slow down as they use it over a course of several months. Software cruft builds up, whatever it is. So there you have it. So that one's still the same. Number two, the iPhone's always behind in hardware stuff. We already talked about that. This is the first time when, no, it's not. It has all the neat features that you'd expect to see on a flagship phone to keep it competitive with Android. You've got biometrics, you've got wireless charging, you've got quick charging, all those kind of things that used to be missing, and even the OLED display, finally, OLED. And then there's the flip side of the fact that the iPhone typically is faster, smoother, and perhaps more secure. It's because it's a very closed ecosystem, and the App Store is very highly vetted also. So usually not as many rogue programs make their way into the App Store there. But the flip side is lack of customization. You've got every year after year, I say the same thing. You get a grid of icons. That's what you get. You know, you get a notification shade now. The UI is the UI. With Android, there's more customizability, there's the widgets, all that sort of thing. You know the drill. And certainly if you want to do things like load custom ROMs, depending on whether something has a locked bootloader, Samsung usually does have a locked bootloader, so don't know if you'd be doing that. But anyway, alternative software, that sort of thing, you can monkey around with your, your Note 8. You can't do that with the iPhone unless you want to jailbreak it, which is a whole nother can of worms. Next point, biometrics. Now you Samsung fanboys, I know you're going to come out of the woodwork and start moaning because you did this even when I did the individual phone reviews. The biometrics on the Note 8 are just not ideal this year because you have that off-center, fairly small fingerprint scanner on the back. Now, one of the reasons I waited a while to do the Smackdowns because I use both of these phones as my daily drivers, I live with them, and I can tell you every day I still curse the fingerprint scanner location on this phone. And I'm always covering up the camera lenses, all that sort of thing. It's not ideal. Now, there are reasons technically why Samsung had to do this. Number one, because there's no room on the front anymore because everybody wants a no bezel design, but it's a pain in the neck. Then you have your iris scanner on this, scans the irises right here. Not so great if you're an eyeglass wearer like me and if you tend to not have the most well-lit environments that you work in. So I, all the time, okay, I, I look at the phone and it doesn't work and I do this. So I look like this crazed woman. 
right? <laughs> so mad at her phone, just to make sure it sees my eyes through my glasses and I don't have my usual sexy lady droopy eye thing going on because it's not going to work then either. So it's secure, it's not so great. Then there's the facial recognition, which is so insecure on this that Samsung won't actually let you use it with Samsung Pay, so I don't use it. So biometrics being a fail are an issue. I think all of us should secure our phones, most likely we do. The fact that it takes me too long to unlock this phone a lot of the time means that much as I love it, I also curse at it every single time I have to unlock it. You do have with the Android something I really like, which is location-based unlocking. If you're at home or at work, wherever you tell it is a secure location, it should stay unlocked. However, for some reason, my Note 8 just won't do that. And that's kind of how Android rolls sometimes. You know, things that should work because you've got so many different manufacturers, different software builds, all that sort of thing, things can sometimes go awry. I have a Galaxy S8 that does work. This one, not so much. But the iPhone, this is brilliant. This is transformative. I said that in the review. You know, I hated to give up Touch ID and all that sort of thing, but there is nothing more natural than your face in front of the phone. It's fantastic. It just works. It feels like the future. You do that, you swipe up, boom, you've got your stuff. Or you just want to see your notifications. It sees you. It's instantaneous. It's fast. It's great. The only bad thing about it is it's single user only. It's only one person's face. Finally, we have OLED displays, right? On iPhones, OMG, right? You did, did you ever think that you were gonna live long enough to see it happen? Well, it finally has high resolution, beautiful OLED display. DisplayMate, who does technical studies of displays, ranks it as the best display. The Note 8 is also extremely high. The, the, the iPhone got the nod as being the better display because it has higher color accuracy and higher complete uniform brightness at max brightness. The Note 8 is also very bright, but it, when you go outdoors and you're like on that max auto brightness mode, it illuminates only some pixels to give you the sense of brightness. I mean, that's academic, whatever. To me, they're both extremely bright and easy to see outdoors. With Samsung, you do have a variety of color profiles, which they did take into account. I personally use the AMOLED photo mode, which gives you a wider gamut, but something more natural and color tuned than the, the auto setting. But some of you do like auto setting. You like the better than life colors. You like that hdr -y look to everything. So this is gonna be a matter of personal taste. If you really like the, the out there color option that Samsung has, that might be for you. Also more importantly is how big the display is. I mean, who wouldn't want the bigger display? As long as you can live with the size of a giant phone in your pocket and the Note 8 is a bigger display. The curved edges on it, it looks pretty. That's why they do that. It has no usability advantage. In fact, sometimes it can be annoying because accidental side touches on They've done the edge filtering pretty well at this point to avoid most accidental touches on it. Expandable storage, uh, you know, Apple is just not going to do it. Apple and Google themselves, they both just hate the idea of expandable storage. So if you want a micro SD card slot, it's going to be the Note 8 all day, all night. Apple's answer to this is the 256 gigabyte version of the iPhone 10, which is $150 more, which is all, almost as much as you're going to pay for a high quality fast 256 gigabyte micro SD card then again, but still. I don't know, when you get to 1150 bucks for that 256 gig iPhone, it just hurts to think about it. So there's that. Durability, <laughs> right? No, 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 no. You have glass front and back here with a little metal frame on. Neither of these is durable phones. You do not want to drop either of these phones. And in fact, Kodabi, who makes really nice slim and light, kind of barely their cases that still offer protection, is a sponsor for this video. We want to thank them very much. Their cases are pretty affordable too. Regardless of that, you need a case with either of these phones. They're both extremely expensive. They're both delicate. They don't would do well in drop tests. There's no winner here because they're both losers. When it comes to accessories, we know that Apple has a super healthy ecosystem of accessories, third party and then first party in cases. Samsung does pretty decently too, but right now wearables is a thing, right? So if you're doing the, the iPhone, then it's the Apple Watch, which is a pretty nice experience. This is a Series 3 LTE one. I like it an awful lot. Uh, Nice thing about this is it's friendly for women with smaller wrists like me because it comes in two sizes. But Samsung makes some really fine products. Here's the gear, right? The latest generation thing. I could not wear this because this is, <laughs> this, you know, no, it's too big for me. So if you're a lady, this might not be an alternative, but then they do have the sport band style, which this, this is my particular one. I wear this when I use my Galaxy watches. And this one's fine and a little bit more wrist friendly for those of us who don't have immense wrists. So both they're both fairly good solutions there. I, I enjoy the Apple Watch a little bit more. Again, it's because Apple does a lot of nice little usability touches, but they're both very full-featured platforms for wearables.
When it comes to the cameras, there are already several detailed comparisons on YouTube and there are web articles for those of you who like to read and look at pictures instead of watch videos. I'm not going to go through that all again. And the cameras are so darn close, it's honestly just, there's almost no point. They both have 12 megapixel dual cameras on the rear with a telephoto lens. For portrait mode, they both take some of the best pictures that are available out there. I, one thing I do like better about the iPhone is their new studio portrait modes. They've got five modes there. They're going to let you take pictures in portrait mode of people, objects, pets, that sort of thing that are like, gee, I'm a genius, you feel like, because it really does a very good job with the studio lighting effects and all that sort of thing. Now, Samsung fights back with their adjustable bokeh. In fact, you can adjust it after the fact, and obviously it's using some software to do that. You just move a slider, so you look at it and you say, oh, the background looks too blurry, it's not convincing. You can reduce it, or you think it needs more blur, you can add it. That's pretty sweet stuff right there. When it comes to the picture quality, I will say that the Samsung typically takes more sharpened photos, and they do a really good job of it too. It doesn't look over sharpened and digital and fake so much. It's a little bit more sharpened. So if you're the kind of person who doesn't do any post processing on photos and you like tack sharp looking, you'll probably like Samsung a little better. What the iPhone does is it takes warmer pictures with more contrast. So they look a little bit more SLR like, alive. And the warmth is great if you tend to take people pictures, it can still be nice for landscapers because you get a warmer, more interesting looking sky and clouds and that sort of thing. But still, if you, if you tend to focus on landscapes, you might like that cool tone. If you do more people portraits, that sort of thing, you'd probably like the warm touch on the iPhone. For battery on these, well, the, the, the Note has the physically larger battery. It has a, it's a physically larger phone. It has more room for a battery. And I see a lot of people that complain about their notes. They love their notes, but their battery life is meh. My particular note has actually been doing pretty well for battery life. It seems to be a little bit hit or miss and depends on what software you're, you're loading, all that sort of thing. Network reception, my S8 has crappy battery life and I don't know why and I've wiped it out and started from scratch. It just is that way. The Note 8 is pretty good. It's a little bit more up and down. The iPhone typically is a little more consistent. And it's, as you'd expect, you know, the iPhone 10 sits somewhere between the 8 and the 8 Plus, having the middling battery capacity there for battery life. Uh, they're about the same. Neither of them is phenomenal. Both of them are good enough for me to make it through the day with moderate use. That's about as much as I would say. When it comes to wireless charging, they both have it. Uh, the Note currently supports faster wireless charging. It could be software updates, and Apple actually enables even faster wireless charging. So wireless charging is typically never very fast in either case, but the Note will be a little bit faster. They both support quick charging. Of course, Samsung uses Qualcomm Quick Charge since they have a Qualcomm CPU. It's very fast. The iPhone supports quick charging, but unlike the Samsung and most any other Android phone on the market, no quick charger in the box. You still get that old fashioned teeny weeny little charger that charges slowly. So you got to go out and buy yourself a fast charger if you want a fast charger, a USB-C based charger and then a USB-C lightning cable. So with Apple, it's always that little additional spend to get there. That part's, you know, that's Apple. So there you have it. The usual comparison points, maybe a few that you might not have considered originally, but are important. And as happens every year, you're not going to lose no matter which one of these you choose. What is new this year is that finally the iPhone is not behind in terms of all those nifty gee whiz features that Samsung's always have that the iPhone does. And we have those things here now, like the water resistance, the wireless charging and OLED display, all those sort of things to keep you feeling like you're not paying for a phone that's missing a whole lot of features. So in the end, what it comes down to is how big a phone do you want? If you really want the big fabulous screen, and I can't blame you, I like big screens too, it's the Note 8. If you like the pen feature, if you're like me and you like to do art, I mean, it's handy having a digital sketchbook in your pocket, or if you like to take notes, obviously. The cameras are too close for it to really be meaningful. You can get plus points for one and plus points for the other, but in the end, it cancels out. Two of the best camera phones on the market are right here. And then there's the platform. Some of you are just pro iOS, some of you are pro Android, some of you are switch hitters and like to bounce back and forth. Honestly, I like both operating systems equally well, again, in different ways. With iOS, it's that security, it's that speed, it's the timely updates. With Android, it's as ever the customizability. You don't have nothing but a grid of icons all day long. There you have it. I'm Lisa from Mobile Tech Review. Be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel for more cool tech videos and thumbs up if you like this vid.